Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with me here today. I'm so grateful for each moment that we get to be able to spend together to talk about our lives, about our business, to up level and to thrive in all that we do. I'm so grateful for you and I'm so glad to spend the time here with you today. Today we want to talk about messaging, about communication, about talking the language of the person that we're talking to so that they understand what we're talking about and they get it. But I want to take a little different angle, not totally, but a little different angle on that, in that I want you to understand that your ability to create effective messaging, to communicate with the people that you know you're meant to serve, that's what supports you living the life of your dreams. You see, it, it all goes hand in hand. It all comes together when we speak in a way that is understandable. Speak to be heard, not, and even more so for our listener to understand it. So it isn't just information that bounces off of their eardrums. Um, it isn't just something that goes in one ear and out the other and all the other, you know, kinds of slogans and phrases that people use about people not hearing what you're saying. We want to communicate in a way that effectively, impactfully, and powerfully impacts the people that we're meant to serve in this world. Our messaging is so key. It's so important. Um, it's such a big deal that we get in front of the right people to begin with. You know, if you're talking about something that the person who you're talking to has no interest in, that's not going to work, right? And then we need to be able to understand who we are and what the life is that we want to lead so that we can express the joy and the excitement that comes out of a message that supports our lifestyle and hopefully becomes an example to them of you can do it too you can have that lifestyle as well and then of course we also want to make sure that the words that we're using are words that the people understand. We are the expert at what we do. Regardless of what that genre is that you work in, you're the expert. And the person you're talking to came to you because they need your help. And now what we need to be able to do is really truly speak to them with languaging and words and things that they comprehend and understand. Because if we say a bunch of, um, and, and we're often really guilty of it, I've spent a lot of years working with, I used to say, translating tech back into English, you know, and, and in technology, a lot of times um, we're guilty of saying things that are just normal and common in our vernacular, you know, we'll use a phrase like SEO. Um, and, you know, and then just blow right past that. Like everybody knows SEO even stands for search engine optimization, let alone what the concept of optimizing something for a search engine is. And so often we need to understand who are we talking to and then not just use our insider jargon, not just use the things that make sense to us, but say the things that make sense to them. And the reason why we want to do that is, number one, we want to make sure that we effectively are helping them and impacting their lives and helping them be the best version of themselves. But we also want to have our best life. We want to be always striving to live as a thriving entrepreneur. So with that said, I have three amazing guests that are going to cover different parts of the aspects of this and really help us be able to get clear messaging that does support 
our life and our business here on Thriving Entrepreneur. I'm so excited to bring them to you. Let's jump right into our first guest. Join me in welcoming Shaheen Cheyenne. Cheyenne, how are you doing today? <laughs> Good. It's Shaheen Shan. Okay. See, I was totally off. <laughs> That's okay. It's kind of a drinking game here on the show for how many times can Steve get her name wrong? So say your first name for me again, please. Shaheen. Shaheen. All right. Try not to mess that up more than 50 times. <laughs> so uh, thanks for being here with us. Tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. How I show up in the world. I like that. Thank you. So I'm an entrepreneur. I empower people to make money in one of two ways. One is on the Amazon platform. And two uh, is by being booked on podcasts just like this. We have an agency called Podcast Cola where we book people on great shows. So if you or anyone you know is interested in getting booked on great shows like this one, reach out to us at Podcast Cola. Um, I started when I was in my teens, um, what might be cool about me, uh, and I've written a book on it, which you can see back here if you're watching the clips, called Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult, where I started a company in my early teens and created over a billion dollars in revenue while I was in my teens still. And I write about that story and tell that tale in Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. I love that. So what is the thrill pill cult? I invented a drug called herbal ecstasy. And it was back in the early 1990s when rave culture was a thing. Dance, electronic music culture was a thing. I left home when I was a teen. I invented this magic pill. And I went from sleeping on the beach to sleeping in a mansion on the beach in one of Malibu's most prestigious areas and having one of the most valuable companies of its era. I love that. Well, um, a lot of us could still probably use that pill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree, man. You know, I think as I've gotten older and now I'm a father and a husband, and my lifestyle has slowed down a bit in that way, I think much more towards improving the human organism and improving our lifestyles rather than just getting a quick fix. Because in general, I think people are always wired to find the quick fix. And if you can delay gratification, and this is what we've learned over the course of the last 50, 100 years of evolution as far as business people go, if you can delay gratification just a little bit, you can get to a place where you are so far ahead of everyone else, they're playing a catch-up game. And that's where you want to be. Those are the guys that dominate markets. Those are the Elon Musks, the Steve Jobs, the Jeff Bezos's of the world. Absolutely. That makes total sense. So what is the difference between, uh, you know, an instant quick fix and actually having a great life? Yeah. So now I can give you an example. What I do is I travel the world. So me and my family travel all over the world. We had an amazing two, three months last year going through the Greek Isles, going through the coast of Malfi coast of Italy. And while we were there, we were creating predictable recurring revenue streams that made us money while we we're sitting at these beautiful cafes, sipping an espresso, eating a gelato or whatever it was we were doing because Amazon enables you and empowers you to do that. Similarly, I was doing lots of great shows like this one, which is how we came up with the concept for Podcast Cola, which is podcast being one of the most powerful avenues to be able to tell your message through storytelling. And it really goes to what I like to talk about a lot, which is as opposed to push selling, the old way of selling where you would walk in and you push your whatever it is, your product or your service down someone's throat, we believe in becoming a decision architect and using pull marketing. And that's where podcasts come in. You tell your story, the guest feels like, or whoever's watching the guest feels like they know your guest. 
they get to know them because they're spending an hour with them on their commute. They're spending an hour with them on their drive or 30 minutes on their drive. And they get to know their story. And whatever it is that they're selling is natural. It's like, yeah, this guy's amazing. He's done all the stuff. I want whatever it is that he's offering. And people will come to you for your product or service. And that's how we came up with the idea for Podcast Cola, which I really think, you know, Joe Rogan broke the mold. And once that was surpassed, the fact that a single podcast could do better than a mainstream TV channel like CNN or CNBC, uh, that, that broke the mold and allowed everybody to go in and to create content that lives forever on the internet and use it to sell their product or service. And it's one of the most powerful forms of marketing, one of the the most efficient and inexpensive forms of marketing I think that we have today and and will live for the next 10, 20 years. Mm, I agree with that so much. So when it comes to sharing our message especially podcasts. And I've been asked this a lot of times, you know, I've had the show here on the radio for seven and a half years now, uh, but people are always asking me, can you really make money either having or being a guest on podcasts? Yeah. Yeah. So just that- tell us how. <laughs> yeah. Look, it, it's, it's kind of like writing a book. We get lots of authors who come on to Podcast Cola and they talk to us about, you know, hey, can I sell books? And the fact is that the book is, unfortunately, I read lots of books. If you can see above me, I've got all kinds of great books that I read all the time, but it's a dying medium. Why? Because you have other ways, more palatable, less time-consuming ways of consuming data, really. So if you want to learn how to do something, you can watch a YouTube video. You no longer need to read a book. I like reading books because I like to get to know authors and I like to do deep dives. I'm afraid that I am a dying breed and I do not represent the majority of the market. Majority of the market wants to watch a two minute TikTok video or a 30 second TikTok video and learn how to do the thing. And rarely do they deep dive and rarely do they buy books, which is why bookstores all over the planet are dying, which is a sad thing. When it comes to selling books, if you say, hey, if I do podcasts, will I sell books? You're like, well, yeah, you, you might sell some books, but you're not going to have the big bestseller that, you know, like a John Grisham or a Stephen King would have, right? So you have to find a way to monetize, which is the point I'm getting to with podcasts. You have to find a way to monetize it with a back end. So either there is a service or a product that you're selling through your book, there is a product or service that you're selling otherwise, uh, your consulting service, your coaching service, your real estate business, an investment that you want people to invest in, an NFT, whatever it is, you have to have a back end. And once you promote that, you really don't need that many sales. Hopefully it's a high ticket item. And if you have something that's five grand or 10 grand or 20 grand and up, it makes sense to do shows. You can absolutely make a profit. Not only that, you can make a killing doing podcasts. So I invite any of your listeners to check out Podcast Cola. It's podcastcola.com. And we do this all the time for people booking among great shows just like this one. I love that. And thank you for, uh, again, sharing the reality of the fact that you're probably, you could, but you're probably not going to make a million dollars selling books and making a dollar or less per book off of them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Selling books is really, uh, um, even even people who I have clients that are best-selling authors, really, they don't sell they don't make their money, I should say, selling the books. They make their money in other deals. Mm, yeah, for sure. So when it comes to podcasting, uh, and I'm, I love this conversation. It's so cool uh, to have it with you. What is the biggest thing that people don't know, and then they try to just go out and be a podcast guest? What, what is it you're saying? What is it that people don't know? And they, yeah, try they to go don't out? know. And they just try to go out and do it because they think it should be easy and they just don't understand. Yeah. I mean, you mean starting a podcast. So we're a booking agency where we book people on other people's well, shows. No, I mean, being a guest. Oh, being a guest. You know, being a guest is pretty easy. 
uh, I think people are like, hey, I'm starting out. I want to be on Joe Rogan's show right away, or I want to be on Adam Carolla's show right away. And we've had guests that have been on Carolla. We've had guests that have been on the big shows and gotten major TV through the work that we've done. But at the end of the day, that doesn't happen immediately. You have to go out there and build a digital footprint. You have to go out there and do some of the smaller shows. Well, people are like, well, I don't want to be on a show where I'm just talking to a thousand people. I want to talk to a million people. Well, what you don't understand is when you're on that show, you're creating content. For example, in this particular show, I don't know what your audience is, but I speak the same as I would to one person as I would to, I just did a show where the guy's got a following of 2.3 million people. And it was the same story. Why? Why do I bring my A game to every interview? I bring my A game to every interview I do because I'm creating content. And now I can take that content and redistribute it over the internet in any way that I like and promote your show and promote my show. And it shows people who I am while it's building that digital footprint and it lives forever. And that's one of the great things about podcasts, but people that are just starting out don't understand that. They're like, hey, why am I talking to some asshole in his basement for 20 minutes? It's not worth my time. It's like, well, actually, buddy, you need to learn how to speak. You need to figure out your story. You need to figure out your pain points, your selling points. You need to figure out your CTA, your call to action. And the best way to do that is by doing it. And you really, truly don't get great until you've done at least 100 to 150 shows. Oh, that's for sure. Um, and, and what's really fun is to go back and listen to yourself on, you know, episode one or two <laughs> and then laugh at yourself and be like, oh, wow, I really didn't know what I was doing then, did I? And how much you fucking sucked. Yeah, <laughs> it's true, man. You know, we think we know everything. It's like when you're a teenager, you're in your 20s, you're like, oh, man, I fucking got it. Right. And then you hit 40 and you look back, you'll fuck. I was an asshole. Right. I missed a lot of shit. Like, man, if I wasn't so fucking cocky, if I wasn't so arrogant, if I took advice, if I seeked counsel, if I seeked mentors, if I just shut up when I was talking, if I was just silent long enough to hear what other people had to say. Hindsight's 2020, buddy. Mm, yeah, for sure. So what specifically does Podcast Cola do for people? We book people on amazing shows. So what we do is we've got a great database of shows that we have amazing relationships with. And we will find whatever your niche is, be it real estate or business or attorney services. And we will go out there and we will find several of the 7 million podcasts that are out there. And we will pitch you. We will create a story for you. We will make you look great. And we will get you booked on those shows. And it's a guaranteed service. I don't know. Most people don't understand how a PR publicity works, but you hire a publicist. You pay anywhere on the very low end, $5,000 a month, usually six month, 12 month contract, all the way up to 20, 30, 40, 50, $60,000 a month. And they don't guarantee you results. So when you hire a publicist, they say, oh, great. You want to be New York Times? You want to be on Joe Rogan? Fantastic. We'll create a press sheet. We'll put it out there and we'll see who, what hits we get. And we might call a couple publications and you might get a hit. And you might not. With our service, we have relationships with these podcasts. And because we prep you in a very specific way and these shows that we are working with need guests, you are guaranteed to have more bookings than you know what to do with. And that's the beauty of Podcast Cola is that it's a guaranteed service to get your story out there and told through the greatest medium of the 21st century. Mm, I love that so much. So if somebody wants to work with you, how would they get in contact with you? Sure. Uh, if you're interested in becoming an Amazon seller, you can reach out to me through my Amazon course. That's fbasellercourse.com. So you can find that FBA standing for fulfillment by Amazon. If you're interested in podcast cola, Go on podcastcola.com and book a time and we'll include it in the show links and I'll take a call with you and see if it's a fit for you to get you on great podcasts telling your story. Well, Shaheen, I really appreciate you spending some time with us here on the show today. Oh, that's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. 
what an amazing booking agency. And I really do encourage you, if you're looking at getting into podcasting, often it is best to have an organization that has the contacts already in place that can help you be able to create that speaker one sheet and can then present you to people so that you can just stay booked up and you can do what you do best. And that's talk about the things that you're good at so that you then have that clear message like we talked about, but you also have a really effective place to be able to present that to so you can live as a thriving entrepreneur. We'll be right back. If you're an author who's on a mission, stand out with your brand out. (laughs) Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing, and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best-selling book, or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best-selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com, schedule a talk with Steve. It's risk-free, it's guaranteed, it's proven, we've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. Let's continue talking about clear and effective messaging that allows us to live the life of our dreams. So let's talk a little bit with somebody who learned the concept of creating a business that supports and allows the life that you want to live. I know you want to hear how that one works. Let's jump into our next guest. Join me in welcoming. Jeffrey Cammy. Hey, Jeffrey, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I am doing good, thanks. Tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Um, so I'm from Chicago originally, uh, from a family of five. My mom was a teacher. We grew up in a very great middle-class neighborhood, uh, raised Catholic, went to Catholic schools for about uh, most of my life, uh, kindergarten, grammar school, and, uh, and high school. And um, raised two, two sons, was married for a long time, lived uh, in a few different places over the country, uh, including Chicago and San Francisco Bay Area, and then also in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I'm just enjoying my life, working really hard. I've started a bunch of businesses that uh, we can talk about, and um, that's pretty much it. So where did you live in Portland? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Where did you live in Portland? Oh, so I lived in, sorry about that. My uh, my audio went out. I lived in like the Lake Oswego area. I moved, when I moved there, um, I wanted to start. My ex-wife, her father was a college basketball coach and he went to coach at Lewis and Clark. And so we had visited there and we visited at a key time, which is the summer. Because if you go in the summer, you're going to love it. If you go other <laughs> times you, and you don't like gloomy weather, because it does get gloomy there. Um, we were there in a beautiful time. And so we ended up deciding we wanted to raise kids there. And so we first moved, we lived in Tigard and off of what they call Old Shoals. And it's way out there. And there, there's so much traffic because it was a growing kind of population at the time. And they had built the highway when it was kind of a country town. And so we lived there for a bit. And then a little bit later, as we got more experienced and had started making a little bit more money, we could afford to live like in Lake Oswego. So we lived there for about five years thereafter. And it was a really beautiful place to live, except for I did gain some weight there. It's a little gloomy there and it is gray a lot. Even though the the rain in California where I live now is more, you get a lot every single day for a bunch of months in in Oregon. Mm, Oh yes, I remember. Um, I uh, lived in Portland in and around the same area you're talking about for, 
I moved there temporarily and ended up staying there for like 20 years. So I totally understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it, though. I thought the people were really great. I think they were, you know, you you did get the real effect of the funkiness of Portland. I think it exists. But I also think that it was a really interesting place to live. And at the time, I know, and I know everywhere is getting more expensive. It still was a pretty affordable place to raise a family when I when I we first started there. And that's why we went there. Sure. So tell me a little bit about some of the businesses that you run. So when I was um, in my 20s, I was I played baseball for a long time and I really loved baseball. Baseball is kind of it's a very statistical driven game, obviously. And if you do things enough times, you become uh, it's trend worthy. So you see trends and patterns develop in baseball. And so after I got injured, I had hurt my shoulder. I still wanted to be part of baseball. So I got I started an analytics company, which was really one of the very first fantasy sports companies. So in the early mid nineties, I was running a company called Dr. Stats Fantasy Sports. At the time, I kind of laugh at the name because, you know, I had secured the domain and I had secured Dr. Stats, DR Stats and DOC STATS, but I didn't know what was going to happen with the internet, nor did anyone else in the nineties. I could have bought fantasy football and all these other great, great names that have probably would have been way more valuable, but I didn't have the foresight to do it, but it was a great business. I ran it for 15 years. Um, didn't do really well when I started because I didn't understand it. And, and I think what, um, especially if you have listeners that are entrepreneurs, what happens a lot of times is you'll start a business and you don't necessarily know where it's going to come from, the revenue, the profits, because you start it and you have one idea in mind and then accidentally something becomes really popular. It's really hard to gauge what's going to be a hit and what's going to be a miss. And so what happened is we were going to run leagues and we, we ran leagues for a couple of years. They really didn't drive any revenue for us. And then we started saying, hey, why don't we have a little component, an extra piece, which was a news piece. And we charged nothing for it, like $10 for a year. Well, that became like hugely successful. So the business actually became the news piece or the subscription-based side. So we started charging $34 for a year for the subscription where we would send out news, analytics, stats, and all these kind of cutting edge at the time. You know, you realize this is the time when there were re rarely any databases, even on the internet. I mean, most of the things were flat file HTML pages. So we were doing some cutting edge technology with databases, crunching numbers way ahead of other people at the time. And we got our own little niche audience that we, that I held for like 15 years. And it was a really, really great business. And I got to do what my main goal was, which was to be home with my kids while I had a business. And so that really worked out kind of in an awesome way. I love that when you develop a business that supports your lifestyle rather than a lifestyle that supports your business. Or you understand what I mean by that? Uh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, I think I'm, I'm, they know I'm lucky. I mean, let's not, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm not the richest person in the world, but I'm, I'm also not, I'm not struggling to feed my family or my kids are raised now, but I'm, but I can, you know, afford to live. And I think I've always been lucky enough to think of having a lifestyle, not a job. And and, and what it's really about, it's kind of like those old simple things. It's do something you love. And, and if you're able to make some money on something you love, and my, you know, my brother has been an artist for years, and that's a hard living to be a pure artist, you know, to either be a musician nowadays or one of these other types of artists. And to be able to do something you love uh, is key because when it doesn't make money, and there are many times when, you know, I'm in a new business right now that's a startup where I'm just writing checks. I'm not getting them yet. And, and that's painful, but if you love it, then you have that. And so that's part of, that's part of the business thing. And I think, you know, and a lot of times too, you know, from a tax perspective, if you're doing something you love, it's stuff you would buy anyway. You know, I was loving that I could go to games, baseball games and watch sports events. And those are part of my job, you know, so that was deductible for me in a business sense. And, and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And it was, but, and cause I loved it and your passion it comes through naturally when you're really involved and interested in something and it's something you really want to do. It's obvious, you know, you, you know, it's that old, that high school counselor guidance counselor thing about like, what three things do you love to do? And then one of those should be your job. You know, if you can figure that out, I think you're happier than most people. Mm. So talk to us a little bit about the new business that you're starting. Right. So um, I have a fund an exchange traded fund that trades on NASDAQ. It's in sports betting and gambling. It's called IBET, I-B-E-T, and it's a sports betting and gambling ETF. And it's, it's what's happening right now. It's just a, we get have a blip in the marketplace where a lot of these new companies that are involved in the fund 
are essentially not doing really well. They're not profitable because they're in huge customer acquisition cycles. And so they're in investment cycles. And so they're not necessarily showing profit that excite the stock market. So it's just, we're in kind of a cycle where we have a tough market anyway, because we're facing these inflationary pressures, you know, the feds adjusting, we're having higher interest rates. We're having higher costs for just our day-to-day lives. And people aren't, you know, these are not the investments that people want to seek right now in the market, but that's also the time when you're a long-term investor goes, you know, that's where Buffett and some of these great investors of all time is have invested. You know, when everyone is leaving, they go in the building, kind of like a fireman kind of analogy for investing. But when it's the scariest is usually when the, the investors that have the most experience will stay in the game. Like today, just today, um, the market was down really bad in the last couple of days. And of course, it had one of these really heavy reverse rallies. And a lot of times, the market will scare out people, and then they they miss those rallies, and then they're you know they're they're they have fits about it because they're you know they they thought they got out and they were being safe, but they missed a big rally. So anyway, in this new business, um, you know, I'm still in a startup phase. We've only the funds only been live for four or five months, and so yeah, so I'm building assets up under management, and it's just a new thing, and it's um, I, I'm building awareness. Cooler. That's part of the challenge I'm facing right now. So I'm not familiar with the term ETF. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah, sure. Exchange traded fund is a fund that is like a basket of stocks. And so what they're really good at is giving you an indication of like what a sector is doing. So for example, if you look at the performance of sports betting right now, we know that most of these sports betting stocks, because they are in such heavy investment cycles, are not doing well. You know, it's because they're in the investment process. Now, um, what so it'll show you if you look at there's a couple other ETFs in the space, but if you look at them, they're all performing about the same way. If you look at something like commodities, okay, so we all know that things that are like rice, wheat, grains, oil, those are all up. And if you look at a commodities ETF, It's actually a really fantastic way to track how much more expensive things are right now because you'll see the rise in commodity ETFs because a commodity ETF will be a great indicator of what's actually happening with the price of goods. So if you were invested in a commodities ETF uh, a year ago, you would have made 50% on it because uh, commodities have gone up so much. So they're just kind of an indicator of what's going on in the marketplace. Sounds good. So... With being a guest on a podcast, are you looking for people who will invest in your fund or what, what's in it for you being a guest? I mean, to just kind of put it that bluntly. Oh, well, I think really what I'm trying to do when I'm podcasting and I go on, because I have a podcast that I do called Stock Smart, and I talk about the marketplace. And I also have one about wagering. It's called The Weekly Wager. What I really am doing is trying to build awareness in the space. One of the things when I talk about wagering is I talk a lot about money management and how I do like to make a bet on sports. Um, And so what I'll do is I talk to uh, the better about how to be wise with your investments in terms of betting, meaning, so you should, you know, bet the same amount money management, be very careful with how you, you know, use your bets. And then when I'm in terms of the investment space, yeah, I'm trying to build awareness. If people are interested in investments that they may want to be or take place in, take part in the fund. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm, I love that so much. So I have a question for you. Sure. Um, You know, because you're in the sports betting and gaming arena and, uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion with that. Um, When is it legal and when isn't it legal? You know, you see a lot of things (laughs) on TV, but that doesn't necessarily mean any of it's true. (laughs) Right, Steve. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, what's going on now is it's, you're seeing most of the states, I think it's somewhere around 30 that have variations on legality. Sometimes you can essentially go and bet on a sporting app, like an app on your phone. And then in other times you can actually go, they'll have an in-person place where you can place a wager. And it depends on the state. And I will tell you, since this is state law, not federal, that the law is different in every single state. And they change and it adjusts. What they want to ideally have because the best margins for these companies is really they want to have online wagering on your phone. And so but many of them have kiosks and a lot of what's going on now in the space is like, you'll see, you know, one of the companies just, just signed an agreement with uh, the Cleveland Browns the, you know, there's betting in Arizona. 
So all over the country, you'll see in stadiums now, they have casinos. In the old days, it used to be like the poo-poo where, you know, they had to separate the gambling from the sports teams, but now they're actually in partnerships. So it's changed so wide, but I actually have a listing of the states that have legalization, but they all have various, it's all various degrees. And where I live right now in California, we have a huge ballot initiative coming up in November. And of course, we have some of the large companies, you know, seeking approval for legalization, but we have like the Indian gaming reservations fighting it because they're used to getting that revenue and sweeping that up. So it'll be a really interesting issue. But I do think that one of the things on the profits for the California legalization, that 90, some huge amount, like 85% are going to go to a wellness plan for individuals, you know, for homeless and, and disabled, things like that. So I do think that the initiative though it is in gambling, will provide some relief for some people who may need it. So for somebody that's really uh, into and or interested in online sports betting, um, can they use your service or? Well, I have a company that, I, that I'm uh, working with called iBet Networks. And that's essentially what we're doing is we're just building awareness for the space. Uh, we, on, on, the, on the site, iBet Networks, we talk about what legalizations have taken place. We have a podcast about called the weekly wager. I don't have, you know, an actual gambling company. I essentially just, I have a the fund essentially represents huge companies that have, le- you know, that are in the space like Caesars, you know, Wynn Resorts, Las Vegas Sands, MGM, those huge companies. And, and of course, uh, many that are in Europe because Europe's had legalization so much longer in Sweden, one of the larger, you know, countries that has had legalization for many years in France that they're also represented in the ETF. So you get some national exposure. What people come to me for is more information and they can get uh, the chance to invest. And I, it's kind of one of those things where if you actually like sports betting, why not kind of be involved in it from an investment perspective too? And I think, you know, that's kind of like the theme about being an entrepreneur. If you're involved in something, you should be invested in it, you know, if you really like it. And that's what, you know, that's what Buffett and all those people would say, you know, if you like Coca-Cola, buy Coca-Cola stock. You know, when I was first a first investor, I remember the company that I wanted to buy. It wasn't a publicly traded company at the time, but I was so interested in that direct TV dish when it first came out in the 90s that I was like looking for stock for it, but it wasn't publicly traded. But I think if there's something you like, you should be invested in it. That is really great advice. And I think it's really cool the and fun, the thing that you're doing in the space. Um, and of course, everybody appreciates your tip of the week. Um, hopefully you're accurate enough that they, um, that it helps people win sometimes at least. <laughs> yeah. It's tough out there. I actually have, a uh, a, a, a person who works with me, who's been a life lifelong, um, wager and he likes to call it wagering, not gambling because he feels there's a skill to it. And he used to work with, um, actually the, the lefty character who was in the casino movie was, was kind of his mentor. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen that movie, Steve, but the casino movie has that great character who was played by the narrow character. And, and this guy comes on our show, um, his, na- his name or his moniker is Uncle B, and he's had a life of experience. So he comes on the show and I kind of, you know, I'll be the host essentially on that show. And then he'll give me his picks and then we'll talk about different things that are going on in the space. And, and so, yeah, I hope we are. And we've had some good success. Uh, leading people to the right picks because uh, it's tough out there. And I know people want to wager, but I think being wise with your wagers, make it fun, keep it fun. And, you know, don't double your money when you have a bad weekend, you know, just make the same bet. That's what I always tell people. I say, if you like to wager, make sure it's within reason and then make the same bet. A lot of times in the old days, what people would do is they'd be down. I don't know what they'd bet, but maybe they'd be down when they'd have to pay the bookie on a Monday and then, and they'd raise their bets to try to cover it. And that's how they get really badly in the hole. And that doesn't prove to really work because it's tough out there. But I, I think people, if they do it for the right intent with enjoyment and entertainment, then they're in a good place. Perfect. So for a person who would like to get involved in either the fund or just to follow your podcast, uh, how can they follow you? Yeah, you can reach me at uh, Inherent Wealth Fund, I-N-H-E-R-E-N-T wealthfund.com, or you can search the IBET, I-B-E-T, ETF, the sports betting and gaming ETF. You can also look up Jeffrey Camus or Stock Smart or the Weekly Wager. Those are all the podcasts that I do. And uh, that's how you can get in touch with me. Well, Jeffrey, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Hey, Steve, thanks for having me. 
do you know what life you want to live? I mean, first you need to understand that so you then can create a business that supports that life and lifestyle that you want to live so that you then know the ways to be able to present yourself and have the messaging that allows that to be supported and allows you to live as a thriving entrepreneur. Let's take another commercial break and then we'll be right back here on Thriving Entrepreneur. Don't go away. If you're an author who's on a mission, stand out with your brand out. <laughs> Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best-selling book or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best-selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Schedule a talk with Steve. It's risk-free. It's guaranteed. It's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today as we talk about really having effective, clear, and powerful messaging that also supports the lifestyle that you want to live, that really does impact the lives of the people you're meant to serve, but it also gives you the ability to live that life that you want to live. So lastly, let's talk specifically about the concept of saying the things in a way that the person that you're speaking to understands that they get it so that they then too can understand and want to interact with you. With that said, let's jump into our next guest. Join me in welcoming Matthew Steib. Hey Matthew, how are you doing today? I am grand, thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Okay, well, I am a lifelong entrepreneur. I had one job when I was 18 and I got fired from it. Um, I've done odd things in my life. I taught myself Dutch. I designed computer games for Lego. Um, I got a pilot's license. But now, rather mundanely, I run uh, an 18-person marketing agency in the UK, and we help tech companies um, sell their wares, basically. Oh, that is both necessary as well as can be difficult, you know, because you have to first speak tech, but then translate that back into human being. <laughs> that is, you've put your finger on it. The heart of marketing is imaginatively putting yourself into the, into the mind of the potential customer, the reader, the viewer, and trying to understand their world and the things they want to do and the things that motivate them. Um, I, I always like to say, you should talk to potential customers about their issues in their language, not about your technology in your language. So um, the secret of selling technology, selling anything really, is not to talk about technology. Mm, absolutely. And that is so tough, especially for tech people, because they think in code and they think everybody else does too. <laughs> yes, they, that, and that, that, we call that the man in the mirror problem or the person in the mirror problem. Um, thinking that your customer is is like you. And yes, for some tech products, the buyers are very technical, but it, it brings with it some other problems as well. Um, I mean, we, we love our techie clients and we, we love, I mean, we're all geeks uh, at Articulate, but um, they also want to tell you everything. And part of the challenge of marketing is selection and prioritization because you know the audience the buyer 
doesn't have an infinite amount of time to pay attention to what you want to say. You know, if they don't get the answer to the question or uh, the, the thing they're looking for, they move on, right? They are, most of their time is not spent thinking about you and your product. Um, but, you know, techies want to be complete. They want to be detailed. They want to be thorough. It's what got them to where they are. So, you know, you have to, uh, you have to apply a certain amount of editing and communication skills just to, to deliver the message efficiently for, for them. So do you pretty much take their words and then make things for them? Or do you help them develop videos and things like that in sales presentations that they then learn to actually say? We, we don't do so much um, video or communication skills training. Um, it, we are mainly, mainly um, copywriters and web designers. So we're interested in inbound marketing and in content and thought leadership marketing. Um, but one of the, the valuable services that I think we do provide, apart from those sort of agency services, is actually sitting down with our clients and really helping them understand who they are talking to and how they want to communicate and what they want to say. So positioning, messaging, tone of voice, audience personas, and that sort of you know, fundamental marketing strategy work. And, and you can tell if you're dealing with a really smart um, techie, they pick this up and then they start geeking out about marketing and then they start challenging you, which persona is this for? And, you know, what's the audience for this? And why isn't this saying this? But that's great. When they engage with that process, they get a much better result. But you, you, you have to do that fundamental sort of strategy. Uh, and I think that's where we, we probably provide the, the, the biggest value for people. Um, and, and if I was running a business and I was selling technology, I would invest in that first, whether you do it with us or anybody else. I mean, just think through, you know, who the audience is, what you want to say, how you want to say it, and why they should care. Mm. Good, good tip. And I love the uh, company name, Articulate Marketing. Um, there's a lot of marketers that really suffer from being articulate in what they say. <laughs> well, I have a, I, I, I've never been very good at naming things it's not a not a service that we provide so in my life i've had two main businesses the, the the computer games business i used to run was called intelligent games and then when i started the, the marketing business or i thought well okay what do i need to call it mm, articulate marketing so I've, I've i've always gone with this rather prosaic adjective noun naming convention but it it, it, it yes it works pretty well and because of communication writing content is at the heart of what we, we do. Articulate uh, is quite a good word for that. And it has that nice double meaning. It's it's um, both a noun and, and a verb. Sorry, an adjective and a verb. Oh, crikey. It's quite late here, so I'm confusing my parts of speech. No worries. So articulate or articulate, in, yeah. it, it, you know, depending on how you want to say it. Right. Um, and so I'm guessing based off of your accent that you're somewhere in the UK? I am. I'm in London, and I am. I am English upbringing. Um, actually, I'm slightly majority Dutch um, in terms of my. It, well, I won't say in terms of my DNA. In terms of my heritage. In terms of my DNA, I'm mostly red wine and donuts. But um, anyway, yeah. So, I, I, but I grew up in the UK, and I've, all my businesses have been here. Do you help people from around the world, or just mostly in the UK? We are. 40% of our business is North America, um, about 10% is mainland Europe, and the rest is the UK. So we're very um, uh, transatlantic, and all our writers are capable of spelling things with Zs, not Ss, and you know that sort of thing. And I used to write when I was a, 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 in between my two businesses, I was a freelance journalist, and so I used to write for Wired and Popular Science and people. So, you know, being able to uh, be a bit ambidextrous with the language is quite important and it's a good skill for writers to have so yeah we, we but we, we we are we do work in english um so the english speaking world is our patch but not we're not limited to the uk hmm. love that absolutely so what would you say is the biggest thing that people struggle with when they're trying to come up with a marketing campaign that really works well, it's the really works bit that's the hard part, isn't it? Um, I can tell you what a lot of companies do that doesn't work. Um, 
they indulge in what I call random acts of marketing. So they'll spend a few hundred or a few thousand dollars, pounds on Google AdWords and quote, it didn't work. They'll do a few blog posts. And we've all seen these blogs that started and there was, you know, three or four blogs published and then they stopped. They might start a podcast and, you know, unlike you, Steve, they might not get very far with it. Um, You know, random acts of marketing don't really work. So the the challenge, I think, for businesses is to take a, a sort of a joined up, a holistic approach to their marketing and really try to make sure they've got all the bases covered to some extent. And what do I mean by bases? Um, well, you need a good website, you need some kind of blogging, some kind of lead capture, gated content, you need some kind of social media, you need a, perhaps a little bit of PPC, you need to be doing a little bit of, you know, so I, I, it, 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 there's quite a lot of bits to it. And I think if you try to solve it with a point solution, you won't solve marketing. So I think that's the first observation. Um, in terms of quick wins, I mean, I, I certainly, for my business, I've, I got where, where I am today with blogging, and, and I think there's really a lot of value to that. Um, of course, podcasting is the new blogging, so maybe that's the thing I would be doing if I was starting now. Um, but that's me. I'm, I enjoy writing. I, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I think, I, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't, got a, I haven't got a magic rabbit in a hat that I can pull out and go, do this, and it's all going to work. Um, I'm, I'm afraid do a little bit of everything and get it joined up and s- think about it is probably right. Um, however, you don't have to do tons and tons and tons of everything. I just think you need to do it in a bit of everything and have it all connected. Um, actually, I'll, get, I'll tell you another thing you shouldn't do. This is something I see very commonly. Um, it, as a business starts getting a little bit larger, maybe you know, 10, 15, 20 people, the founders say we probably ought to do some marketing now you know there's usually a few salespeople knocking about at that point so the salespeople go yes we need we need some marketing to feed us leads and you tend to get at that point a very very junior very very overworked marketing person who basically usually ends up doing a bit of email a bit of social and organizing events or at least back before covid um and I think I think under investing and over hoping for that that junior first marketing hire is is a risk. I mean, obviously, my interest is I would like people to come and hire an agency because then they get a, a range of skills and a range of people. But if you're going to hire a marketing person, you know, ante up and pay a bit more money and get a good one. That totally makes sense. I love that. So. Um... What you said, tech to people, um, is there a certain kind of tech company that you like really working with? I respect, I respect people who know their, their field and who know their business and who are willing to communicate with, with me, with us and, and, and with, through us to, to their customers. I think, I think the ones that are, um, sort of resistant or uncommunicative are more challenging to work with. So I, I like people who are able to explain what they're doing and, you know, it, it kind of bring it, communicate it to, to our level. Um, I also really respect the clients who are put enough, of a, enough time into learning enough about marketing that they can hold up their side of the conversation. They don't have to be marketing experts and they don't have to spend years and years and years doing it. But, you know, there is such a wealth of marketing resources and training out there. I mean, HubSpot, for example, has, you know, an online academy that you can go and, you know, do all these courses for for the sake of spending four or five hours of watching some online videos and paying some attention and reading some blogs. You know, the people who do that get much, much better results from us. Um, And I think I think so. I mean, I'm trying to generalize here about what works well. and, and I, I, the last point is just just applies to anybody in any business relationship. But it, it's so much nicer when you're working with amiable people. You know, just be a mensch, just be a nice person, an honourable stand up. You know, pay your bills on time and listen, take advice, turn up for meetings. Don't don't be you know don't be a don't be an asshole, <laughs> which sort of ought to go without saying, shouldn't it? But I'm right. sadly not every, well, not all the time. Absolutely. So if a person would like to work with you, how can they get in contact with you? So 
I would love it if people came and had a look at articulatemarketing.com. That's our website. Articulate marketing is all one word for the URL. There is There are hundreds of articles which you can read for free and learn about marketing. Um, I do a fortnightly uh, webinar, which is also you can view the, the library for nothing. And, you know, this is this, so there's a lot of resource there. Um, if you wanted to um, have a chat with me, um, articulatemarketing.com forward slash meet, M-E-E-T. Um, that's my online calendar. Just book up a slot and let's have a chat. If you're in London, come on over. I'll put the kettle on. We'll have tea. Love that. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Steve, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. How do you show up in the world? How do you communicate the you that is you so that the person that's listening really gets it so that then you can invite them to be a part of what you're doing, to be engaged with you, and they can really feel powerfully impacted by what you do as well, so that you can really truly help people find solutions, have the life change they need, do the things that they need the help for, that they're searching for you right now for, that when they find you, they want that solution. They already want it desperately. Now we just need to get to the place where we express it in such a way that they can get it, that they can take the information that we give and run with it, can really effectively and powerfully really get things done. I'm so excited for all of us to have the capability, the understanding of how to better speak the language of the person that we're talking to so that we can then really truly thrive in all we're doing because we help the person that we're talking to thrive in all that they're meant to do in this world. I love the whole concept of each of us being a light, a hope, and a solution for the people that we come in contact with the world. Now, not everyone is your ideal client, but hopefully everyone that you're meant to serve can understand what you're doing and what you're talking about so that they can easily say, yes, I do want to be a part of that. I do need that. And I see that you do have the solution that I'm looking for because you are uniquely brilliant. You were created for a purpose. The world needs you. Specifically, there are people who are looking for you. They need you to stand up, be clear who you are, and then clearly identify to them, I have that solution that you're looking for. Here's what it is. Um, and then we can go on to all the things of marketing that and effectively and powerfully helping those people out. But first, we have to just simply be able to communicate to them, I see you, I know where you're going through, I've got you, here's the solution. I hope that you will do that, that as you move through your day today, that you are thriving and truly free, that you're happy, you're safe, you're warm and loved, and that in all you do, you live as a thriving entrepreneur. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. If you're an author who's on a mission, stand out with your brand out. <laughs> Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing, and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best-selling book, or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best-selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity, and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far, and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com, schedule a talk with Steve, 
believe. It's risk-free. It's guaranteed. It's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. You